Welcome back. We start part seven. And the focus of this part is E.S. Ibn Kapisa. If you have been following uh, not just my current channel, but my previous channel, you'll remember that many years ago, I suggested that E.S. Ibn Kapisa could possibly have been the inspiration for Muhammad. Well, it turns out that um, A.J. Juice has come to a similar opinion, and he places him in... in uh, the beginning of a line of Muhammad's. This is from the end of our last uh, program. The presence of Caliph Umar in the Rashidun lineup requires that uh, Elijah Bar Kapsa, aka the Jewish exilarch Huziel, was the original king and Muhammad. Without speculation, Eas ibn Kabisa al Tay, which refers to the fact that he belongs to the tribe of Tayaye was Muhammad and also the Jewish exilarch Huziel. The text clarifies that Jufen, or Kuf-Hun, this is referring to the Chinese source that we saw in the last episode, was in the southwest region of the Taiye, bordering to a vast sea, and that the black stone was removed away from Jufen and placed in his kingdom. All this information depends on which portions belonged to them in the 650s AD and to which extent they were already creating a new communal memory. Somehow the story matches Sebius's remark that the Jews went elsewhere after the Ishmaelites had thrown them off the Temple Mount. So which one is it? If we consider that inadmissible tradition places the first fitna in the 650s AD, southwest at the sea can be from Jerusalem, to the Sinai in the Umea territory, and perhaps Medina or Sana, Basra, perhaps in the Allied realm. Alexandria or Cairo would not fit because they are not desert lands, and Petra is too far removed from the seas to merit such a reference. Whichever of the two gains the upper hand in the conflict is still a Tayayi, is still a Tayi. Now, um, so in contradiction to A.J. Juice's determination, and it makes perfect sense to suggest somewhere like Jerusalem, um, I looked into Jufen, the Chinese term, what might be described as the together city, because you can see here, I've, I've actually, in order to get this meaning, I've separated Ju and Fen and uh, found it meant together. So... Jufen Medina would be the together city. And a candidate for that would be the combined city referred to as Mahose, which is a combination of Tessiphon and Seleucia. As you can see it there, it's on the river Tigris, so Seleucia is on the western side and uh, Tessiphon is on the eastern side. So that's one possibility but the, the problem with it is that it's not beside a sea so that doesn't work um, so unless uh, they are misleading the Chinese in some way it's it's hard to make sense of it can't quite see how Jerusalem could be considered a together city um, Jew Finn you, you could argue the the Jew part suggests the beginning of Jerusalem maybe it's a bit of a stretch though um so we kind of have to leave that hanging it doesn't quite work but a little later um i had another look again and i found a deep learning translation tool online I put it in jufen they came up with a beauty of a translation which actually now makes sense it means both in dispute or in dispute could you find a better description for Jerusalem, a city that it has been, it seems, permanently in dispute for centuries and centuries? So that could be it. Maybe that's the solution to um, where Jufen is. But as I say, it's speculation, but at least it works with what we've got now. The Tang Annals also mention another breakaway, a woman kingdom in the northwest. Uh, we can see the reference there. There is also... a uh, a women kingdom which is at a distance of three months travel northwest of Dashi, which is another 
way of saying the Taiyai or the Taiyi. Um, so where could that be? Um, well, if you consider where Iraq is um, and take a line three months travel northwest of there, um, could be anywhere really. Um, you're talking probably Eastern Europe, maybe the Baltic states, that area, maybe. Um, it's, but I don't see how that, how that kind of tallies with any place in particular. If you have a solution for that, um, please put it in the comment below. But uh, I've uh, racked my brain on that one. I couldn't come up with one. But if you can think of anywhere where that would fit, uh, please do. The only place where I can think of um, a matriarchal kingdom would be somewhere like Mongolia, um, which traditionally has had uh, uh, a matriarchal community. Uh, but that's a long way from where they're thinking of here. So I don't think that quite works, um, obviously, geographically. Um, so any suggestions, you know, uh, somewhere northwest of Iraq, uh, where was there a women kingdom in the 7th or 8th century? Okay. Despite the confusion, it is clear that Husro did not allow this reconstruction of the temple, as tradition claims. They broke off under Taiyi leadership, that before held the Persian governorship under Elijah Bar Kapsha. Regardless of the territorial uncertainty, we can now solidify what happened. In 609 AD, Husro promoted Elijah Bar Kapsha, chief of the Taiyi, to become Persian vassal king over Neri that stretched from Alhira to the Red Sea larger than the tribal alliances of Lakhmids and Ghassanids combined. One of Muhammad's early aliases was Kapsha. Tying him back to the Third Jewish Roman War under Simon bar Kosaba or Kokba, and of course to Elijah bar Kapsha. Its massive trained army led to the near collapse of the Byzantine Empire and the conquest of Jerusalem. The Chinese source tells us that Kapsha's Persian son broke off from the Temple Mount and declared a separatist Jewish regime. Now it emerges why Jews were a persecuted minority that was forced converted by Heraclius and Husro. It had nothing to do with anti-Semitism but everything with a coup d'etat that was executed by the Jewish Marzutran leadership. It is in the name of the business with being kings that other kings attempt to extinguish their seed. A feature of Jewish kings is that they push their entire Jewish population over the cliff before backing down. Why? Because it works. Compassion is a powerful force with the few that have a grain of humanity left. These Jewish kings play the compassion card successfully and have no remorse when using their own as human shields and cannon fodder. Most of us can see it today. Well, certainly would agree with the sentiment that plenty of people down through history have used other people as human shields when it suits their own interests. The modern West frowns at collective punishment and views it as horror of a long gone past. In the barbaric minds of Iran's Islamic leadership, annihilation of Israel is in their daily prayers today. The entire energy of their brains appears to be sucked up by a single-minded mission, kill all Jews. These leaders with eyes as deep as the abyss to hell should have a second look at their genealogy and at the fact that their very hatred gives license to Israel's inhumane treatment of Palestinians. It's a classic vicious circle. Hatred breeds hatred. Unsuspecting Jewish disciples and Muslims happen to be among the many victims then as now. While the Iranian leadership laughs about the sheep-like behaviour of its Muslim subjects, it misses that we no longer overlook that wiping out all Jews is only a middle goal toward ruling the world with Sharia law. After all, it is so commanded in the Quran, and ISIS made it unmistakably clear. Never should Iran or any other theocratically inspired tyranny be allowed to even come close to weapons of mass destruction. The Iranian leaders simply do not care about the consequences to the Iranian people and the rest of the world. It probably takes a minute to wrap our heads around what the primary sources tell us. 
The Marzutran Exilarch Huziel is Muhammad. The Marzutran Exilarch Nehemiah is Muhammad in a chain of Muhammads. No interpretation is needed and no explanation other than knowing the context. Let me repeat that. The Jewish Exilarch is the Islamic Muhammad. The Jewish Exilarchs form the chain of Islamic Muhammads. The history of the Jewish Herodian Marzutran Exilarchs is the history of Islam. Elijah bar Kapsha, a.k.a. Eas ibn Kapisha al Tay, a.k.a. Muhammad, a.k.a. Huziel, was the 35th Jewish Exilarch and father of Nehemiah bin Huziel, a.k.a. Muhammad, brother of Salman al-Farisi, a.k.a. Muhammad. So we were seeing a chain of Muhammads as we've come to suspect for some time now. This is why we know nothing about the Jewish Marzutran exilarchs. Through Islam, we can learn everything about them. So if you go and try and find out about these exilarchs, there's a blank slate there in front of you. Why is that? Why is there a gap in the in the history? Maybe it's because they don't want people to know who they were and what they actually were doing at the time. With this primary evidence in hand, no Muslim can deny whether they are supporters of Ali's, Umaid's or Abbas's lineages that their religion rests on pure fiction by the Jewish leadership. Let me emphasize that again. What he's saying is the entire standard Islamic narrative is pure fiction created by the Jewish leadership. As we have already seen, the deceit by the Marzutran Jewish exilarchs has deep roots in the past and true upcoming Islamic dynasties. After Husro dismounted them, the Jewish Ishmaelite alliance appears to have fallen apart. Saying it like that hides the fact that both groups were led by Marzutran Jewish leaders. Should we expect two or more different Quranic branches that later merged together as one? The different founding years tell us that an Islamic state was not yet founded and that they come to work together at a later date. But as the legendary histories of Islam reveal, Muslim sectarians shine at a distinctive skill, killing each other. Moreover, the Tayyi were themselves split with the Jadila branch converting to monophysite Christianity as Ghassanid allies and migrating to Syria before the events of Proto-Islam. The Goth branch stayed in Jabal Tayyi, the Salma and Sharmar mountains in the northern Arab peninsula, and were allied with the Lakhmids. Did the stone move to Ha'il, to Al-Hira, to a Syrian or to another location? We cannot yet know. However, two legendary leaders of the Tayyi are among the companions of Muhammad according to tradition. One is the Shamar leader Adi ibn Hatim al Tay from Hayil. He was Jewish Christian and would probably have brought the stone to the Hatim al Tayyi palace. The other is Zaid al Khair from Najid, whose main cities are Riyadh, Majmama, and Bureda. Both are thus from the Goth branch. Let me say this. Without the citizen scientist Mel Sneakerman from Islamic origins pushing ad nauseum for a closer look at the Chinese sources, I would never have spotted it. Well, thank you, AJ Juice, for that kind compliment. Under the Umaid Caliph Hisham, Iraq, Iran and North African Berbers revolted around the year 740. Even earlier, in 736, the king of Gurjaradesa seems to have succeeded in driving the Arabs, uh, Chajikas, i.e. the Tayyi, from the Indian city of Valavi, the centre of Buddhist learning with 100 monasteries and 6,000 priests. However, Caliph Hisham prevailed and was supposedly unanimously re-elected for another term. 
by the judges, i.e. the Jewish judges. This prompted a civil war. As I said, they went up in flames not because of doctrinal changes, but because of succession. Now, if you look at the section below, you can see there that the Moors that had initially helped in the Shiite Ishmaelite conquest of Spain, the word Berber means barbarian, respectively foreigner. And um, Mozarab Chronicle of 754. In 742, Abdul al Malik was again elected king of the Arabs with everyone's consent. At that time, Hisham, seized by an iniquitous rage, loosed the bridle of his cupidity, leaving it unrestrained, and all the peoples under his power immediately flung themselves into civil war. All that vast desert from which the Arab multitudes had arisen was full of unrest, unable to tolerate the injustice of the judges. And in the western region, which extends to the southern zone, and which is occupied more than any of the others by the Moors, the inhabitants openly shook their necks from the Arab yoke, unanimous and determined in their wrath. From this time, we have a five-branch candelabra on a coin that was minted in Jerusalem with the imprint, There is no God but Allah alone, and Muhammad is Allah's messenger. The coin is obviously Islamic, inverted commas, but whether it is a Byzantine Orthodox candelabra or a Jewish menorah that feigns to be different from Judaism, we cannot know. Under a new covenant, we could expect that the supreme leadership may have wanted to communicate non-Jewishness, crypto-Jewishness, and would want to use a modified but still familiar symbol. The menorah typically has seven or nine branches. Even the oldest menorah has seven branches engraved on a coin issued in the 30s BC by Antigonus II, Matthias. It is a feature of the Exodus from Egypt in the Torah that was supposed to be eternally lit in front of the tabernacle. Only to add to the confusion, we can find Islamic seven-branched menorah coins from around the same time during the 8th century. They also contain Muhammad's Bismillah. So the fact that there are these would suggest that there is a Jewish link uh, to Islam. The evidence cannot be twisted. The menorah was a symbol of an insignificant minority, does not make it to be the main subject on a coin in times of turmoil, unless this insignificant minority is the ruling minority. So the idea here, essentially, if you didn't get it, is the fact that the menorahs on the coin suggests who is the ruling um, elite at the time. According to inadmissible tradition, Hisham was killed by his cousin, uh, Yassid III. The latter's mother may have been the daughter of Peraz III, son of Yadzagar III, the last Persian ruler. Yes, that is the same uh, Peraz that was relocated by the Chinese to modern-day Karanj, Afghanistan. This marriage made Yazid's lineage unclean and unacceptable for Jewish leadership. Nevertheless, he had promised reforms and gained the support of political parties that believed in freedom and the human free will, ideas that were later wiped out. Now, for those of you uh, unclear where Karanj is, it is in the southwest end of Afghanistan, just inside the border from Iran. Meanwhile, Spain was also in uproar. The Aryan king of the Goths, Theo Dimmer, had revolted against the rule of the Arabs, as they were called. In Yemen, a seeker of truth, Talib al-Haq, proclaimed himself caliph in 746 AD. Two years later, the rebel was assassinated. al dahak ibn Qais al-Shebani started a Karajite rebellion in 746 AD. Karajites were the house of Ali, then founded by Ali himself, uh, Abdul Allah ibn al-Zubair, a.k.a. Exilarch Heman I, according to Ajajus. Coins from Kufa and Mosul were struck 
by Karajites. Are they coming from the East? Now that is upside down thinking. The Abbasid revolution started in Merv, tradition says, under the leadership of the Shiite Abu Muslim and Jude al Kurmani from the Yemeni faction with the uh, Azid and Rabia. They were supported by Kataba ibn Shabib al Tay, a Tayyi from Khurasan. Merv fell quickly to the Abbasids and the rebellion spread across Khurasan and Persia. Fighting against the Abbasids was one Jewish leader, Abu Isa al-Isfahani. He was an illiterate tailor and Jewish prophet, a messianic figure who accepted Muhammad and Jesus as true prophets to Judaism. The New Testament and the Quran needed to be studied. It would be surprising if it were any other way, because without the background of the Gospels, much of the Quran cannot be understood. It is also how proto-Islam worked, plus the Torah. Never mind that we find Abu Isa a couple of births down from the Jewish exilarch Hanamel, a.k.a. Salman al-Farisi. While Abu Muslim was governor of Khurasan under the first Abbasid Caliph, but only perhaps the second al-Mansur had him executed for heresy. Part 8 is a good one. Uh, it's going to be looking at the story of the Abbasids. So I hope you come back for that. Uh, talk to you all very soon.